it's a pleasure to join you all today. And in some ways, this is a continuation of the power session I had in February at the CADCA uh, 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 meeting at National Harbor. And so it's really a wonderful opportunity to continue the discussion. If any of you all participated in that session, you will recognize some, maybe not all, but much of the material. But please uh, uh, ask questions, uh, both in the Q&A session, and, and we'll get to those when I wrap up towards the end of this. Now, uh, I'm going to be focusing for you on the issues of methamphetamine. But I want you to think about this as an example of poly substance use. Because when we think about substance use, both by teens in terms of primary prevention, and particularly among those who become involved in the treatment system and have serious issues related to a use disorder, whether that's alcohol use disorder, opioid use disorder, cocaine use disorder, or methamphetamine use disorder, there is tremendous overlap of those conditions with other substance use problems. So it turns out while we think of each of these substance problems kind of on their own as separate issues, they cluster together in important ways. And so this example of methamphetamine and opioids, this is really the current major problem in so many parts of our country, uh, is just one example of how substances overlap in important ways. And I'll try to illustrate that major point as well. Now, when we look at the current state of the US overdose crisis, um, I think this graphic tells a couple of very important stories. One, uh, we see that the major substances involved in overdose deaths have shifted over time. So we saw heroin and the crack cocaine in the late 90s, early, uh, late 80s and early 90s, prescription opioids for the first decade of this century, followed by heroin. And then for about the last 10 years now, synthetic opioids other than methadone. That's a general way of saying fentanyl and related compounds have been driving this increase in overdose deaths. But there's, other, some, there's something very disturbing about this graphic. Notice that it continues to go up and it goes up in some ways even faster towards more recent years than previously. This looks like some of those COVID pandemic curves where you see it going up and you wait for it to level out and then come back down. Well, we aren't seeing that in the overdose crisis yet. And so that's a very disturbing and concerning feature of this, of, of this problem. And we'll touch a little bit on those, but I would say we think we don't know what explains this continuous rise across different substance subtypes across different regions of the country, but it looks like it may relate to both uh, broad drug distribution factors. For instance, with both methamphetamine and synthetic opioids, the fentanyl compounds, we see drug dealers uh, shifting to synthetic drugs that are easier to transport, easier to smuggle, and in some ways can be even cheaper to produce than the agricultural products like heroin uh, or cocaine. They come from plant-based products to begin with and then are synthesized into, uh, into white powders or chemicals. But these synthetic drugs may be a particular problem. Okay, I've highlighted this for you a little bit already, but just to remind us that when we look at the overdose deaths in the most recent full year, that would be 2020, it was about 92,000 deaths in 2020. The majority of those being related to the opioids, whether that's illicit, illegal, or the prescription type opioids. Uh, when we look at data from 21, that's preliminary, those numbers are now over 100,000 persons dying in the US in a 12 month period. So it's really a serious and progressive and increasing problem. As I mentioned, it was the prescription drugs in the early part of this century. Uh, and those have not disappeared, but they did level off and stop increasing. We saw heroin increases in the second decade of this century, but then notice that they've been dropping off in the last couple of years, which is kind of an intriguing thing. We don't think of heroin as going away, but that's really because synthetic opioids have taken the place of heroin in so many drug markets and the illegal sales of a white powder on the street is often not heroin any longer, but would be fentanyl and fentanyl related compounds. Now, as if these opioids weren't enough, what we've seen particularly in the last now six or seven years is stimulants, cocaine and methamphetamine, increasing in their, in their cause of overdose deaths uh, and representing a very large portion of those dying of overdoses now. 
Now, what's been happening during the pandemic? Now, this is using data primarily from uh, preliminary results from the National Center for Health, Stati Center for Health Statistics. Well, what we've seen during the pandemic period is an increase in overdose deaths overall. That's this graphic on the left, showing each of the months following the onset of the pandemic in uh, uh, March. So it starts in April of 2020 and beyond, showing a market increase that was pretty, it jumped up and then it's been stable since that time. These are mostly explained by increases in synthetic opioids. These are fentanyl related compounds that have caused a that have been responsible for an increasing number of deaths uh, during the COVID pandemic. But notice that stimulant involved deaths also have increased, particularly these are methamphetamine deaths for the most part have increased markedly during the pandemic period as well. When we look just at a map of all the different states in the, uh, in the US, we see increases in almost every state. Uh, those are color coded so that the darker orange represent a larger increase. For instance, in the west part of our country, we see marked increases in overdose deaths, where some slight declines in uh, a couple of states. But for the most part, the overdose crisis has been increasing in every region of the country, even during the most recent 12-month uh, period. Methamphetamine has been explaining a, 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 an important part of this increase. And when we look just at the last five years of data, what we see is a shift from the West that had overdose deaths related to methamphetamine have had for many decades on the West Coast. But we see a, an, an eastward extension of this uh, uh, methamphetamine-related overdose deaths, where many parts of the Northeast now have significant problems related to methamphetamine, particularly the mid-central parts, Ohio, Indiana, Kentucky, Tennessee, West Virginia, seeing market increases over the last few years related to this new, relatively new for them, a synthetic drug, methamphetamine. Now, this is data that compares the overdose death rates for cocaine, and methamphetamine. It's called psychostimulants, but generally most of the psychostimulants that are involved in overdose deaths are methamphetamine substances. So in blue, what you see is that the rates are highest in large metropolitan areas. As we go down this range to smaller and smaller metropolitan areas or truly rural areas all the way over here on the right, you see the cocaine is not terribly common as a cause of overdose deaths in rural areas. On the other hand, methamphetamine is pretty evenly distributed across these centers, but particularly in rural areas, we see methamphetamine being a very common cause of overdose death. So I think it reminds us that the geography of drug distribution varies. And methamphetamine, while it is seen in urban areas, no mistake about it, these are very high rates of deaths in urban areas, but for rural populations, it's been particularly devastating. We also see important distinctions across different racial and ethnic groups where American Indian Alaska Native individuals have had really frighteningly high rates of methamphetamine related deaths uh, and those have skyrocketed over the last decade. Uh, I also would point out that African Americans, we don't think of as being historically as involved with methamphetamine have seen an increase in methamphetamine related deaths in the last few years. So these show that the, while the increases are seen in every racial and ethnic group, they've been particularly apparent and the increases have been particularly noteworthy for Alaska Native uh, American and American Indian individuals, white individuals and uh, African American or black persons in the US. Now let's shift gears and go from, we, we've talked about overdose deaths, how this has gone from prescription opioids to heroin to fentanyl and now methamphetamine is part of that, so the synthetic drugs broadly. What are we seeing in terms of drug seizures? So this is from law enforcement. What are we observing in terms of what the drug dealers are getting caught with? What we've seen in the last few years has been a market increase in cocaine and methamphetamine. Notice that the numbers for FY19 and 20 markedly increased, particularly in 2020 for cocaine and methamphetamine. Heroin remains at stubbornly high levels, but fentanyl has increased in these seizures markedly over the last few years. Okay. Before I started the talk, uh, Jacqueline introduced me and said that I would talk a little bit about what was going on during the pandemic. Well, 
let's focus on this. Why might we think that the pandemic would be related to to uh, the overdose crisis and what, what, what might explain this. We certainly have seen headlines like the ones illustrated here about how the, the overdose deaths have increased during the pandemic. Well, what, what might help us understand some of this? Some of it has to do with a key risk factor for relapse or use of substances will be stress and pressure and stigma. Those are all key factors in the onset or relapse to substance use. And certainly this pandemic has led to tremendous stress for individuals. We've seen limited access to medication and limited peer support that might have play a role too in some of the relapses we're seeing. I would also say that there's a very practical reason why overdose deaths might be seen uh, during the pandemic. That somebody who's alone when they use drugs is much more likely to die of an overdose. And indeed, that's exactly what we're seeing during the pandemic is that people are isolated and by themselves. Using drugs by themselves is a major risk factor for a, a, a fatal overdose for a very practical reason. There's no one there to try to resuscitate you or save your life to supply the nasal Narcan or the opioid antidote or to call for emergency support. Now, overall, the current opioid crisis, as I showed you some of that overdose deaths, death data would be that we, we, we see that fentanyl and the illicit opioids uh, are particularly responsible for uh, overdose deaths and the increases in the last year. But methamphetamine has been increasing uh, in, in the mid-central and eastern states. Uh, the fentanyl compounds are moving west. I'd also point out that counterfeit pills are a major issue. Uh, we've seen where the uh, Drug Enforcement Administration has alerted us to the millions and millions of these counterfeit uh, uh, tablets or medications that look like a prescription medication, but actually contain fentanyl. Uh, we've also seen fentanyl contamination in other illicit drugs. So when, when drug users think they're going to use methamphetamine or cocaine, they may not just get the substance they're looking for, but may have a, uh, a toxic poison in the form of fentanyl in their substance as well. Now let's shift gears and talk a little bit about methamphetamine itself. Um, I, uh, uh, I wanna highlight for you a little bit about its uh, particular pattern. It's a very addictive or habit forming substance. It can be quite toxic, particularly in higher dosages and it's hard to treat. So this is a recipe for serious public health problems related to methamphetamine. Of course, acutely in terms of the short-term effects and what people are looking for is some increased alertness, energy, and an intoxication or a high or a positive feeling. But it can also be associated with aggression or violence, uh, particularly when people have taken uh, significant dosages, psychosis, that means their mind playing tricks on them, seeing, seeing things that aren't there, hearing voices, having paranoid delusions are a typical part of, a, of excess use of methamphetamine. Cardiac complications are not unusual. Strokes, seizures can be very serious problems. When people use this for a long time, one of the most significant impacts is a difficulty experiencing any pleasure other than use of methamphetamine. <coughs> Excuse me. So one of the things that I, I emphasize in treatment and in treating patients with these disorders is that there's sort of two tasks. One is to help uh, 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 unlearn the use of these substances. So change patterns of behavior so they don't rely on them, but also how to learn to get pleasure from regular activities is a major challenge of substance abuse treatment and long-term recovery. Now, when we look at some of the reasons people are, are using methamphetamine, this study uh, in 2019, where they did a, some qualitative interviews with drug users, one of the things that really surprised me is that users out there in the community think methamphetamine is safer than heroin. So they're not recognizing that methamphetamine itself can be associated with uh, uh, cardiac complications and poisonings just like opioids can. It's a little different because it doesn't cause the respiratory depression. After all, stopping breathing is what kills somebody that overdoses on heroin or fentanyl. But a poisoning or an overdose on a stimulant like methamphetamine typically involves direct brain 
uh, uh, complications or cardiac complications that lead to death. Now, I highlighted for you when I started that overlap among these substances is very typical. So let's look at some of the data. When we look at persons who use methamphetamine, we see that about 20% of them use heroin, about 25% use prescription stimulants, 30% use prescription sedatives or tranquilizers, about the same number use cocaine, even more, 40 to 45% have used prescription opioids, Many of them, about half of them, smoke cigarettes and are dependent or addicted to nicotine. About half of them drink in a binge pattern. And the majority, about 70%, use cannabis on a regular basis. About 25% have a serious mental illness. And when we look at the experience of any mental illness, it's about 60%. So these are persons, those who use methamphetamine are very likely to have a very complicated course and a complicated outcome because of these whole host of other substances being used and the psychiatric problems that accompany use of these substances. Now let's step back and look at polysubstance use just as a concept among youth and teenagers. And this graphic shows the overlap among the major categories of substances that teenagers use. Uh, just to remind us that while I illustrated for you how polysubstance use, that is use of multiple substances is common in methamphetamine, but that's true for many, many substance users in our country. So we look at teenagers who use tobacco, a large number of them and a, a significant proportion use marijuana, use alcohol, use other drugs. Very few use only one substance. And so the overlap among these broad categories is significant for the teenagers in our country. When we look at adults, uh, and we look at the uh, a pattern of overlap of substances, I, I think it, there, there's an interesting phenomenon going on. So in red, what we have is the percentage of the US population that use these various substances. So for instance, 86% of the US adult population have used alcohol at some point in their life. Most people have taken a drink uh, uh, at some point during their life. Cigarettes have been used by 60% of the population. This doesn't mean currently using, but at some point in their life. About 50% of adults in the US have used cannabis or marijuana at some point in their life. 16% cocaine, 11, 10.9% LSD, and so forth. Down to about 6% have used methamphetamine at some point in their life. And then 2% have used heroin at some point in their life. By contrast, let's look in each of these groups at what are the number of other substances used? Because there's an interesting phenomenon going on here. Notice that as the frequency, how many people use a particular substance diminishes, the likelihood of using other substances increases. So among those that use alcohol, on average, they use 1.8 other substances. So they're likely to use cigarettes, marijuana, and or one of the other substances. About uh, on average, they use close to two other substances in addition to alcohol. For cigarettes, which are less common than alcohol, it's about two and a half other substances on average. For marijuana, it's about three other substances. But by the time we get down here to methamphetamine, they are likely to use at least six other substances. So it's a reminder that as substances become more rare and the more serious, uh, 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 ones with the most serious social and, and uh, uh, consequences, that we see tremendous overlap with other substances. Polysubstance use is the rule, not the exception. So I hope that you'll take away from this talk that there's a strong relationship across substances, that this might be because they share some of the common or frequent neurobiological features. And I'm not gonna go into that today, but that's an important consideration. But the reason these overlap is because we have one brain and it seems to respond to all the substances in common ways. So are, persons that use one substance may figure out that another substance can have a similar effect. We also know that prevention can have an impact across a range of substances. And I'm gonna come back to this in a minute. And I think particularly for you as coalition members, it's important to keep in mind that the work you do with early teens to provide a protective shield may spread its protection across multiple substances. I also think recovery support cuts across multiple substances as well and is typ typ typically 
the issue. So what are we doing about this overdose crisis? What's our federal government doing? Well, for one, we're focusing on multiple components of an overdose prevention strategy. We're including primary prevention. So what can we do to keep youth and teens and young adults away from these substances that are life-threatening to begin with? What can we do in terms of harm reduction to reduce the acute uh, uh, harms and overdose risk factors? What can we do to enhance treatment and make sure that treatment is available to all those who need it and that they avail themselves of these treatments? And finally, it doesn't do much good just to treat people for a short time. What are we doing to help support recovery in the long run to make these a lasting or long-term change in, 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 in someone's life? Now, when we think about prevention, you all are very familiar of the idea of risk and protective factors, the idea of of, of prevention will be to reduce risk factors. So reduce the issues of uh, parental supervision, poor social skills, and to improve protective factors, improve positive relationships, improve parental monitoring and support, focus on schooling, focus on anti-drug policies. These are kind of the examples of domains that can be shifted with good prevention programming. I think some of this has been overlooked in our approach to dealing with the opioid crisis. So I had the pleasure of writing a paper a couple of years ago now with colleagues from CDC and SAMHSA, where we emphasized that an underutilized approach to addressing the opioid crisis or the overdose crisis generally would be to focus on primary prevention. Now, one of the examples of this is this wonderful set of studies coming out of Iowa where Dick Spoth and colleagues, now going back uh, about 15 years, during the previous methamphetamine crisis in the Midwest, showed that the youth who had participated in their universal strengthening families program uh, intervention were much less likely to begin down that path pathway. So, those in red, you see that those that participated in the program either had no methamphetamine use or 1% or in this other study uh, leading up to uh, 12th grade, about 2% had used methamphetamine about six years after the intervention. On the other hand, those that didn't get the intervention were two to three times more likely to use methamphetamine. Now, this strongly suggests the potential value of these middle school universal effective prevention programs like the Strengthening Families Program 10 to 14. So I highlight that as, as one promising uh, approach to addressing methamphetamine from a prevention perspective. But when it comes to treating methamphetamines, uh, we, we do not have medications that are proven to be useful. Though I'll give you an example of something we're developing right now. But we do have proven therapies, whether that's uh, uh, cognitive behavior therapy, but particular contingency management that is using small rewards administered in a consistent and methodical way to help shape behavior and reward people for not using meth methamphetamine and not using stimulants. We see that the behavior can be changed. When you combine that with positive reinforcement from the communities, this can have a very beneficial effect. We also see a full model called the matrix model being developed by UCLA as an approach and 12-step facilitation is also showing some promise in uh, addressing methamphetamine use disorder. Now, I am pleased that we had one study published uh, uh, last year uh, suggesting that we may be uh, uh, approaching a time when we will have some medications for methamphetamine use disorder. This looked at a combination of bupropion and an extended release naltrexone and showed that in two studies, uh, we had abstinence rates that were about fivefold more common in those that got the medication than those that didn't. Now, while I say fivefold more common, and that's a major effect, it still means that we, only, we had about 14% who are abstinent or had a good response during these studies compared to only about 2% in the control group. So if they got the placebo medication, they almost universally relapsed and were using methamphetamine. On the other hand, if they got the active medication, they had a, they had a, a likelihood of remaining abstinent from methamphetamine. Um, I certainly know that we, need, we have room for improvement, but this is at least a good starting point to develop treatments from. Now, at the National Institute on Drug Abuse, we're always working on new ideas. So one 
example that's, I think, fascinating is the use of vaccines or antibodies. I think because of the COVID pandemic, we've been hearing a lot about vaccines and antibodies. So people tend to understand them a little more than they did in the past. The idea of the vaccine or antibody treatment is that for a drug to have its effect, it has to get into our brains. Well, to do that, it has to cross a barrier from the circulatory system into our brains. And there are cells that line our blood vessels and prevent large molecules from entering. So oxygen can get through, sugars can get through, so food and basic uh, 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 items can cross into the brain. But this is a way of keeping the brain uh, uh, without toxins and major uh, uh, viruses and bacteria to a degree, it's of course not perfect. Uh, but the idea is by attaching an antibody uh, to a molecule like methamphetamine, it keeps it out of the central nervous system. And so there's no intoxication, there's no high, and that can uh, help lead to the positive outcomes. Now we haven't figured out how to do this in practice yet, but there's some uh, initial studies that show promise and so we're developing these areas. I would also say that brain stimulation using magnets is a very promising approach. We've seen these magnetic stimulation devices be useful in the treatment of depression, can be useful in the treatment of, of tobacco use disorder. It can reduce tobacco cravings with stimulation to certain parts of the brain, particularly the uh, uh, frontal lobes of our brain. After all, judgment and decision-making starts in our frontal lobes. So by strengthening those pathways with magnets, uh, we may be able to change the judgment and decision-making that are such a key part of methamphetamine use. Now, I wanna end just by reminding us that while we think of methamphetamines producing major brain problems and major issues, we do see improvements over time when people are abstinent. So I think this reminds us that the brain, just like we see people's behavior improve and change, the brain itself can recover with abstinence and uh, with avoidance of methamphetamine over time. Now, just to summarize for us, methamphetamine is highly addictive, it's potent, and it's associated with very severe health effects, including overdose deaths. Uh, the pandemic has made this overdose crisis worse. And while we don't have medications for methamphetamine, we do have psychotherapies that can be effective. And so we encourage people to avail themselves and to use effective treatments for this condition. We're working on new tools and new approaches at the National Institute on Drug Abuse. So I hope to be able to share with you some breakthrough treatments at future meetings. I think something you can do is focus on stigma and harm reduction approaches as a key way that communities can help respond to this crisis and the entire uh, overdose crisis. But I look forward to your questions and comments and I'll wrap it up now and we'll open it up for questions. Jacqueline, you are muted. You know what? It's been two years and somehow I'm still doing that. Um, if you could maybe share that last slide um, with the Q&A. Um, CADCA's prepared some questions um, for Dr. Compton and we'll go through those. Um, and then uh, and then we'll take um, audience questions. So if you have any questions for Dr. Compton, please go ahead and put those in the Q&A box, not the chat box. That'll um, help us find them easier. Um, also, I can share my screen if that's easier. That might be easier. Why don't you share your screens and I can keep an eye on the Q&A. Okay. Well, the first question related to what do we think are the factors? Well, of, of course, when we think about substances, it's multifactorial. We know that there are family factors involved in use of substances. We know that there are neighborhood. There are drug dealer factors. So some of it relates to what's sold in your neighborhood and what's used in your, in your area. Uh, uh, Megan Hauser brought up trauma. Certainly early childhood experiences and a uh, history of trauma, abuse, and neglect are a major risk factor for use of all substances, methamphetamine included. But I would say that methamphetamine has some particular uh, issues, and I was particularly intrigued that those that are heavily involved in other substances are turning to methamphetamine in large numbers. And some of that is because they think it might be, they're hearing, like all of us are, about the overdose deaths related to opioids, 
And so they're thinking this might be safer. Unfortunately, that's an example of uh, uh, jumping out of the frying pan into the fire. So it's going from one serious problem to another as opposed to really preventing it. Are there any prevention or early intervention strategies that I recommend for poly substance use? Well, I think it's important to keep in mind that some of our effective uh, uh, middle school interventions, whether that's, I highlighted for you strengthening families, I could highlight for you the strong African-American families program that Gene Brody's developed in uh, Georgia. It's a very interesting program uh, that's been implemented in rural populations. Uh, I think that the life skills training and some of the middle school interventions, they aren't really focused on any one substance, but what they do is equip youth to make more positive life decisions that may have an impact on all substances. Now, some of them are tested and, and proven effective for one substance or another, but many of them have an impact across a broad range. And so those make sense to me uh, as rather than focus on one substance at a time for prevention, we need to think about approaches that provide more of a protective shield generally. Uh, I'm particularly a fan of family-based uh, uh, support. I think that the family-based interventions can play a key role in early childhood development and might help by strengthening families. And I mean that in the general sense, not the strengthening families program, but by family strengthening uh, 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 programs, we might be able to address some of the long-term consequences and the long-term risk factors that lead into these, these problems. Um, there was a question in the chat as in the Q&A about geography too, but uh, what do we have for to tailor your prevention efforts to your community? Well, I think you need to know what the substances are in your community. Certainly tobacco, alcohol, and cannabis is virtually universal. Uh, so unless there's something very unusual about your community, those are key, th those are problems that everyone will need to pay attention to. But when it comes to the issues related to cocaine, to heroin, to fentanyl, to uh, prescription opioids, to methamphetamine, there is variation across different regions. And so understanding what's happening in your local area is key. Law enforcement can help with some of that data. Sometimes there are school-based surveys that can help with that data. So paying attention to what the local problems are will be key. Okay, I can read the questions in the Q&A session. So let me just read about them. Can you speak to reward deficiency syndrome? What we, we can do to embed RDS into universal screening and support uh, for families with newborns? Well, uh, I'm not sure that I know what you mean by reward deficiency syndrome. Reward deficiency uh, is an issue for, and she's clicking on an article, so I'll quickly possibly be able to look at it fast and see what it, it's pointing me towards to make sure that I know what I'm responding to. Um, while that's opening up, and before I talk about the reward system, let me... Uh, it's a very interesting idea. Um, okay, now I get it. Uh, when we think of uh, uh, substances and what sort of links all the different substances, one of the common features is people's reliance on substances as a rewarding or reinforcing uh, uh, substance. So what we mean by that is People organize their lives around a substance because that in some ways becomes the main way that they gain pleasure or excitement or fun or intoxication. Those are all normal experiences that we all experience around family members, around friends, um, going to a wonderful sporting event or a top-notch concert or listening to beautiful music or all sorts of other ways, eating a good meal as other ways to have peak positive experiences. Well, it turns out that both an, an innate diminishing of our in our reward centers may be a risk factor for the onset of substances, but in particular, common across all these substances are differences in the reward systems of our brain. And so addressing these as a, uh, as a uh, understanding that their commonalities across the substances may be important. What we don't have is a way to test for this and to say, this person has a reward deficiency syndrome and this one doesn't. 
because there's so much overlap in, in, the, in the differences in reward systems among persons with and without substances. So these are not useful as clinical tests yet, but they might be down the road. So if we can predict which youth are particularly at risk, we might be able to target our intervention so that for certain groups, the family support and the family interventions may be particularly essential to change their lives. I think I addressed that. Somebody asked about the program in rural Georgia. I was referring to the Strong Afri African American Families Program, SAAF, and the investigator who has uh, been the one to explain it and describe it is Jean uh, Brody, B-R-O-D-Y. If you have trouble finding it, shoot me an email and I'll send you some information. Now, vaccine uh, is in the planning stage. May it increase the dosage of the user? Um, this is a question about anything that blocks the effects of drugs. Can't people just overcome that and take more of a drug to achieve the effect they're looking for? Well, uh, that is a major uh, uh, concern. And so that's why even with something that sounds like it may be promising, we need to do the clinical studies and clinical trials. Um, it's a little beyond the planning stage. Some of the vaccines are in clinical trials and in clinical studies because there have already been at least pilot studies to show some proof of concept and show that people do diminish their, their use of substances uh, when these vaccines produce a good antibody response. Um, but it is true that it is conceivable that they might increase their use of a substance to overcome that blockage. Uh, it turns out that in practice, though, that, it, that doesn't seem to be the, 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 a, a major complication. Okay, and then the next question is, THC and marijuana lobbyists have pushed increased access is the potential for reduction use of substances like methamphetamine and heroin or opioids. Is there any evidence that change in the laws have had an effect one way or the other? Um, the, the, the short version is the evidence is weak at best that we see a beneficial effect of the recreational or medical marijuana laws on use of opioids. There is a reason to think that it might have an effect in that people that ought some people use cannabis or, or cannabinoids to treat their own painful conditions. And so if they're relying on cannabis, they might be less reliant on opioids. So that's a theory. We have not seen the data to support a specific association of the cannabis, changes in cannabis laws. You'll see some publications about this, but it is not a, a settled issue by any means. One of the things that had surprised many of us though was I expected the cannabis laws to be associated with markedly increased use by teenagers. I figure once you reduce the barriers to cannabis access for adults, that teenagers would follow. But it turns out we, we the, the, the good news is we have not seen a market increase in cannabis use associated with these changes in, in uh, recreational or medical laws. Uh, on the other hand, we haven't seen any particular improvements either. Teen Intervene has been used quite a bit in my, community, uh, in my community. Any thoughts on that choice? I don't know the data regarding Teen Intervene. I'm, I'm always enthusiastic about people trying to develop new interventions, but uh, I would look at the data. And if it isn't clear that it's been studied and tested uh, in a reasonably well, at least a reasonably well-defined uh, project, I, I would be cautious about implementing it. Our field has a history of implementing prevention programs that don't work as well in practice as we would expect. So while coalitions in general can be very effective, uh, it depends on how well they're implemented and not every implementation is gonna be successful. So pay attention to what the recipe is, the, the examples and the data behind those examples as you're selecting programs or approaches to use in your community. How does a fatal meth overdose occur? Is there medication to counter? One of the reasons that we are developing antibodies to methamphetamine, and that's not the same as a vaccine. A vaccine's goal is for your body to generate, uh, uh, for, for, for your immune system to generate the antibodies that may latch onto a particular virus, or in this case, a particular chemical. But you may have heard about administering uh, antibody uh, uh, medications to persons who have COVID. And that's a way to use antibodies from another individual that are harvested by basically uh, 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 
uh, it, 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 it's like harvesting platelets when you go to donate your blood. Um, the machine can separate out the antibodies and then those can be used for somebody that needs them in a clinical setting. Uh, that, that process of using antibodies from another source, from whether that's another person, or in this case, antibodies developed in a laboratory setting and administer them, that may be a way to capture the methamphetamine and keep it out of our brains and so reduce the likelihood of overdose. Now, a fatal meth uh, uh, um, intoxication typically means that there's an, an arrhythmia or there can be blood vessel spasm. It causes major uh, changes to the nerve transmission. And so blood vessels may clamp up producing strokes or heart attacks. Uh, it can also be associated with seizures. And those are the typical ways that an overdose occurs. Okay. Is research being done on how raising awareness of harm impacts drug use behavior? In general, for teens and youth, uh, a, an approach that simply focuses on harms have not been shown to be effective. Teenagers assume that the harms will occur to other people and not to them. And so the idea that we can scare them away from substance just hasn't worked well in practice. Uh, some of these uh, uh, approaches, though, is we do need some, some communication of the potential risks and harms so that people will consider that they might want to change their behavior. So I see these, this communication of harms as being a necessary ingredient, but if you use that as your only tool to change behavior, um, it's unlikely to be successful. And we have a history of, of simple of scare tactics actually either not being successful or sometimes even backfiring as there's sort of a message to teenagers in some of the scare tactics and that they may, if you're a risk taker, you go, oh, that looks kind of interesting. I don't mind taking a risk or taking a chance. Uh, and so we have to be very careful and uh, uh, see that it might uh, uh, backfire on us. And there's some wonderful information in the chat backing up kind of what I'm saying. So thank you very much, Megan Hauser. Jacqueline, I'm not sure um, if there are other questions or how you, what, what, what yeah. our next steps are. So I don't see any other questions in the Q&A box. If anybody has them, you can go ahead and enter them. Um, but I did put a little reminder in the chat box. Um, but I just want to say a reminder to all the participants that an email will be going out in the next couple of days that's going to include a link to the recording, the slides, um, the article that was discussed, as well as an evaluation. And at the end of that evaluation, you'll be able to download a letter of participation. You do have to complete the evaluation to receive that letter of participation. Um, and I also recommend downloading it immediately because once you navigate away from that page, becomes very difficult to get back. Um, obviously, if you run into that issue, we can address that, but a lot easier if you just download it there. Um, and I just wanna thank Dr. Compton for a really wonderful presentation. I know I learned a lot. I'm particularly interested in those vaccines. I'm gonna have to do some more research on that. Um, and we just appreciate your commitment to providing relevant and current material. Um, and thank you to our webinar participants for your comments, questions, and insights. Um, we had some really great uh, questions in the Q&A. Um, I do see one last one coming coming in. Um, if you wanted to answer that, um, sure. Distribution of fentanyl strips to stimulant users recommended as a harm reduction strategy. I'm not sure. I have some concern about fentanyl test strips. They were not developed to test drug supply. They were developed to test saliva or urine for the presence of drugs. So they are developed and approved for testing in biological specimens. And the actual uh, uh, ability to detect uh, uh, fentanyl in drug compounds, it does seem to be apparent. And some drug users are finding that it, it gives them the encouragement to change their behavior. We also see in some locations that it just, fentanyl is so common that it isn't providing any new information. But when it comes to methamphetamine or cocaine, I do think that some users want to test for it to make sure that they're not potentially putting a poison in their body. Um, I just think we need to learn more about how it works and whether people really do change their behavior. So I'm not against it. And I know it's now allowed by 
uh, uh, in many jurisdictions. But I hope if you and your community are using it, that you'll collect information on it so we can learn from your experience and you can share that with other communities. I really want to highlight something about CADCA and the community coalitions, because I've been a fan of CADCA now going back at least 20 years, as long as I've been at NIDA and probably even a little longer than that. Drug use is not a national problem. Wait a minute. You work at the National Institute of Drug Use. What do you mean it's not a national problem? It is a problem in every local community and neighborhood in our country. Your set of issues will be unique to your neighborhood and you need to come up with a plan for how to address these issues that are, that are gonna be effective for your community. And it's by, by recognizing that these are family, individual family and local factors that CATCA really pays attention to based on its, its, its overall purpose of communities and community and to drug coalitions, that I think we have the potential for having the largest impact on these problems. So I, I, I really wish you all the best. And I appreciate your comments in the response to this program, because it helps me figure out what to do next time and how to do it better. So thanks very much. And um, Anita is asking, you have fentanyl test strips, what type of data? Well, find out how your drug users are using them? Um, are they changing their behavior? Even descriptive information about, yeah, we're getting reports that people tested their, their methamphetamine and then when they found that fentanyl was gonna be in it, they either didn't use at all or they made sure they had naloxone nearby as a way of, of resuscitating their friends if they were to overdose. Uh, we see just so many horrible examples of fentanyl poisoning people that to my, to, to, to my simple brain, the answer is, don't use these substances at all. But for those that are using them, making sure that we have uh, rescue materials, that means naloxone in particular, readily available is key. Yeah, thank you again so much. Um, we had a great conversation. I, I love hearing you know, everybody's thoughts. Um, and if anybody has any further questions for Dr. Compton, um, his email is in the slides. It was on one of the last slides. And since those slides are being emailed out, um, that's one way you can get in contact with him about this material. Um, but we hope to see you all at another Research into Action webinar. Um, and I hope you all have a great day.